I remember back in my Tencent days, I, I was chatting with a couple of Supercell folks and trying to figure out when when I could come visit um, Helsinki. And the thing they all told me was that it was much better to come during the summer than the winter. And so that was my that, that, that's my that's my watchword. Got to got to wait until June or July. But I, yeah, that probably would have been my, my advice as well. So maybe even July or, or as late as August. Uh, but but then of um, course you know you, you you could come for for the slush, which is like a, probably the worst time of the year. So it's it's yes. either late late November or early December. <laughs> yep. And Ilka, we you you know you know A16Z invested in uh, in mainframe, of course. And so we we originally were going to come out and and uh, you know hang out with the company and and do slush and all that stuff, you know, all kind of on, on a single trip. But then obviously we'll have to wait till, uh, till after COVID for that. Yeah. Right, right. I'm actually moving out to Sweden in June, which is going to be really interesting. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, good, good Stockholm. Timing good, good timing in the move. That's yeah, for, for sure. Day. I'm definitely, I'm more worried about the light and dark than I am about the cold and cold and warm <laughs> that makes sense are you uh are you in new york still andrew yeah yeah new york and philadelphia um pretty gray here today but uh getting nicer uh just like in uh in helsinki but uh worse education still all right Makes sense. Awesome. Well, I think the room is uh, the room is starting to fill up. Um, it normally takes a couple of minutes for people to join in, but I, I can go ahead and just sort of do sort of a, a quick intro to the room, and um, and I imagine more, more folks will come as the session proceeds. Um, but everyone, you know, welcome to this week's Games Clubhouse. We talk every Wednesday on, on trending news and, and topics in the games industry. And uh, this is Jonathan live from, from Andreessen Horowitz. And I'm here with my fellow co-hosts, Andrew Chen, also of A16Z, uh, Seth Civic, a proletariat, Andrew Green of Stillfront, and then we were just joined by uh, by Kelly Wallach at the Indie Mega Booth. Um, and we have a very special guest this week, uh, Ilka Pananen, uh, the CEO and co-founder of Supercell. And you know, just as a quick refresher, you know, Supercell has created some of the most popular mobile games of our time, including um, one of my favorite games, Clash of Clans, which I, I looked it up in Wikipedia right before this call, has apparently been downloaded over 500 million times. Um, there's only a handful of games, as you can imagine, in history that's actually had that level of playtime, and you know, Supercell has, has, created, has created one of them and, and many other successful franchises as well. Um, and, and Ilka is a veteran company and culture builder across a couple of companies. And so I am super excited to learn from his experience today. And, and thank you, Ilka, for, for joining us. Hey, thanks very much for having me. Awesome. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's jump into it. Um, so Ilka, tell us a bit about the origin story of Supercell. Like, how did you get started? It sounds like you were coming off of another startup at the time. Um, you know, just just tell us a bit about those those early days. Sure. So we we founded Supercell. Like I, I guess it was almost like eleven years ago, and and we were six co-founders. Uh, at that point, uh, it was year two thousand and ten. Uh, so each of the co-founders had been in the games industry for like uh, ten years each, give or take. Uh, at, at at that point. So you know we had like worked in mobile in mobile games you know AAA console PC games social games uh, kind of you, you you name it so uh, really like a broad set of experience from different type of games and and platforms and and, and also gaming companies and I, I myself uh, uh, had founded with uh, some others uh, our first games company back in the year two thousand. Uh, uh, which, which called Sumia, which we then like later on sold to a company called Digital Truck, which then I had had been there as a uh, working there as a president for almost almost six years, like before when I left in in, in early two thousand and, and, and ten, and, and you know like the, the group like had been we had been very lucky to be part of teams that had shipped some pretty successful games. But you know, as those companies that we had previously worked in like had grown. 
it seemed that the same thing seemed to happen like over and over again. Uh, and the thing was that the control tended to move away from the creative people, away from the game developers and, uh, for, uh, and away from the game teams, you know, to more kind of many managerial type of people and more kind of business operation minded minded people. And, and, and also like, you know, when the, the companies uh, grew in, in terms of headcount, then they also tended to, um, you know, add processes and, and management layers. And of course, all of those things were like very well intended uh, by, by uh, you know, the leaders of those companies and, and myself included. So I'm here sort of criticizing myself because I was definitely part of the leadership team at, at, at Digital Chocolate and I, I, I did all of those things. Uh, but, you know, I mean, and, and, you know, at that company, for example, like we, we had the best intentions. So we thought that, you know, we, all of these processes and, and this kind of amount of control would lead actually to us creating better games. Uh, but, uh, but uh, game developers especially. And, and as I said, like while it was very well intended, you know, many of these companies became a very, very kind of top down run companies. And then, you know, like how mm -hmm. actually like a super so got started. I, I still remember this moment. I think it was in 2009. Um, it was the first, I, then I, I first, it was the first time I saw the kind of the, the infamous kind of Netflix culture deck, which I'm sure they kind of uh, uh, leaked out to the internet on, on purpose. But I, but you know, I, I was really impressed about their kind of values, and in, in particular, I remember how they talked about this culture of like freedom and responsibility. And and while they were talking about the freedom and responsibility of individuals, you know, me and and few others started to like uh, get excited about this idea, like what would happen if you would apply that same thinking to sort of teams. And then we sort of came up with this like a little bit crazy thought, at least at that time, which was that. You know, like what would happen if we kind of um, we tried to build a, a completely different type of gaming company, and and the main idea would be that you know we would like kind of like flip the traditional organizational chart like upside down, and instead of like you know giving the control and the power to the leaders and and the kind of CEO and the leadership team of the company on on the mm -hmm. top, we would actually give the power to the individual game team. And, and, you know, these game teams would completely own what they do and, and you know, be like totally independent. And, and, and you know, the one way we kind of thought about these game teams would be was that we would think them as kind of their own little startups within the kind of greater, greater company. And then somebody proposed that we should actually call these teams cells. And that's a partly where their name Supercell then, then it comes from. You know, so <laughs> I, I think the company was very much formed around this idea of like, uh, you know, but it's all about the people and, 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 and you know, like but, but it should be the game teams and the best game developers who actually like run the show. Okay, you had this, I think this famous expression that you use in another call um, where you describe the CEO of, as their weakest, like the weakest person at the company. Is, is that right? Yeah, I think uh, I, I used to be phrase uh, that I want to be the least powerful CEO. Uh, and, and, you know, what I mean, what I mean by that is that I, I fundamentally believe that the more decisions the teams and especially the game teams make, you know, the better it's it's for everybody. And the reason is like twofold. Like first, you know, uh, the, the game these teams are closest to the, the games, obviously, and also closest to the players and the players need. So they, they should know best, like what's the best, what's the best thing to do for their game. And the other reason is that obviously if these decisions are made by the game teams, uh, and, and there's like no approvals required, then it means that decisions get 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 made like really really quickly, and the execution is just much quicker and and, and also better in my opinion. So <laughs> so in in an ideal in, so in an ideal world, like the game teams would make all the decisions. In which case, I would make no decisions, which I guess would make me the least powerful CEO. Hey, uh, Ilka, I always had a question I wanted to ask you because the the uh, philosophy of creating like the small teams that you know, are really nimble and agile and can add all their kind of creativity into the process without that overlording. How, when you started to grow, how did you think about like central operations teams that service those, um, those development teams? Like, was there a philosophy to, to how like central operations would work as well? 
Well, I, I think that's something that they kind of learned on, on the way. So uh, initially, of course, like the only thing that they were like just trying to do was to build a successful game. And, you know, it actually like it, it actually took us a while to get there. It took, took, us, took us uh two years to like, you know, ship our first like successful game. And, and before that, they had like many, many misses um, and, you know, killed games. Uh, but once we then uh, we were able to get our first like uh, uh, hit game out called called Heyday uh, back in the summer of 2012. And, and, and then, you know, we actually started start to grow like in terms of the users and the revenue started to come in. Then, you know, then of course, at that point, we start to be busy in like building like some of the central teams. And of course, the first one was, uh, you know, building a kind of player support team. Uh, and, and then, you know, later on, obviously, like, since then, they built teams, you know, marketing teams, uh, uh, and, and, and also like a, a over time, like a central tech team and, and, and those type of, type of teams. So like, the, and, but, you know, like, uh, even though like this, this culture of like independent teams, it's originally what we really meant about it. I mean, it was all like focused on, on, on the game teams, but then they realized that actually like to a certain extent, you can also like apply the same thinking to the central teams as well. Although, like these days, we say that the, the game teams are the ones, the teams that are kind of most independent and they sort of sort of set the rhythm and the pace for the company. And everybody else like is here to kind of help those game teams to be successful, including all, all the central teams. Mm -hmm. so, I, I, so I guess you could say that in, in a way, the central teams are less independent than the, than the game teams. I'm curious, like, <clears throat> sorry, go ahead, John. I was just going to make a quick comment that um, in, in general, it feels like the reason that you guys started Supercell was in, in particular, you had this sort of specific culture that you were trying to build and, a, and an organizational design that would promote that culture of sort of these, these bottoms up sort of decision making from, from small teams. And it's interesting to note that that's sort of, um, uh, you know, that, that's very different from what I believe like most most startups today try to do, which is they identify, you know, a product that they're trying to build or a problem that they're trying to solve. And then they go and they tackle that and then the culture and the organizational design is something that comes out of that problem or that product. But instead, it sounds like you guys actually kind of went into the culture or cultural organization first and then the games actually emerged out of that. Is, is that the right understanding? Uh, it, it is exactly the right understanding, and and sometimes I like when I remember or trying trying to remember the old days. It's it's almost funny to me that you know we actually like the very first meetings that we had with the Supercell co-founders, they were actually quite uh, focused on culture. So we we did things like literally we went through, for example, the Netflix culture deck like slide by slide, and everybody would like chime in and say that, okay, here are the things that I agree on this slide and here are, are the things that I disagree with. So we actually talked so much about like, not just about the type of games we want to build, but probably even more so we talked about what type of company we want to build and what type of culture we, we want to build. And, and for us, it, it, it was like, it was really was all about the people. One of the things that like, I've been really impressed about with Supercell and I'm curious, like, as you mentioned before, Heyday wasn't, wasn't your first game it was really the first kind of successful one and so you had ended up killing some games before that and and obviously have in the past like and been, been really good i think about you know ending ending projects that they don't feel like they're going to make it like how was that how hard was that to do before you'd really found a hit to be able to like kill a game and then how has that evolved over time I mean, obviously once you have a couple of hits it makes it a little, i think maybe a little bit easier to handle but like how has that evolution and, and like was that something you set out to do initially or was it just something that came out of it of like hey we just we need to be on top of the fact that we need to be we need to be ruthless a bit on on the projects that we want to move forward with well it's a good question like in, in a way I, I don't think it it has become like uh, i would say that almost any easier to kill kill the games it's always a very sad moment and, and you know mostly because like there's you know, a group of people have put a, put like a lot of their time and effort to that that game, and it, it, it in in many ways it's it's like almost like a kind of a baby of these these developers, and you know just you feel very sad for the team because you know they, they did their best and then it eventually didn't work out. So I, I think even these days we do a lot of you know we, we do still kill a lot of games, and we, not only do we kill games, we kill great games. So it, it's but but it, it's always a a kind of sad moment. Uh, uh, and you know, like if I think about the the early days, like uh, I, I guess it just happened because, like the, I mean, everybody at Supercell at the time, like 
we had like our our bar was really high like what what you know we you know we we kind of were on this mission to kind of create games that you know people would play for a very long time games that would sort of become part of people's everyday life and you know and and we still are on this mission and and we and we, we basically we, we want to build games that would essentially be remembered you know forever and 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 uh and that games that would become part of the kind of history and and you know we look up to companies like nintendo for example like you know who've been able to do that like like decade over decade over decade uh uh and you know like so that's there the bar was like from very early on uh and and you know the first couple of games that they put out it was very clear that that they were nowhere near like reaching reaching that bar uh and uh and yeah of, of course it, it you know the especially when you are like a pre-revenue company and, and you be, and you pretty much kill you the only game that you have out there it's i guess in in a way it's it's it feels even worse mm-hmm. than maybe the game that when killing games feels 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 today but I, it's never never fun but i but, but maybe those are like some of the kind of moments that i'm sort of proudest about like in the history of the company it's maybe not i mean of course i'm proud of the hit games but i but, I, but i'm equally proud about these moments where you know we've killed games and it has always been a very tough decision but in in many ways like these toughest decisions that they made have often been sort of the best decisions they've made i i want to talk a bit about hiring and sort of finding the right talent for your company because it feels like um a large part of why this culture worked if i had to guess was because you were also just phenomenal at recruiting the right people that would thrive in this environment and culture and so maybe Talk a bit about how you think about, um, like, you know, either, either now or, you know, in, in the early days of the company, like finding the right talent, you know, making sure that, you, you know, you have the right co-founders, that you have the right sort of early team and, and how you scaled from there. Yeah, so, I mean, because like the, the whole idea of our foundation of Supercell and founding Supercell back back in the day was that it's, it's all about the best people. Like, you know, we... I remember when we were putting together, you know, the Mikko, we, we, we kind of, kind of the other kind of main co-founder, when we were putting together the Supercell team, we simply asked ourselves that who are the best people we've ever worked with. Uh, and, and, you know, like from that group of people, we kind of put together the, the first kind of six, six co-founders. And then, you know, since all those six co-founders, we had worked in, at different companies and had a pretty wide network of people we knew, especially here in Helsinki, which has a very thriving, you know, uh, games industry and, and, and lots and lots of uh, gaming talent over here. So uh, then I, we, we kind of the six of us like uh, joined the recruited, maybe the next sort of maybe 25 people or, or so. And and of course, like, you know, we recruited every single one of those persons. We, we in most cases, we, as I said, we, we had worked or, or we knew somebody who had worked with those people before, and, and so we were we knew exactly what they were getting, and, and we knew that these people would be aligned with our values and culture, and and of course would be just you know really talented developers, and then you know then you then you can get to the size of like around thirty, uh, of like of a very kind of tight group of culturally very aligned people, and then that group of thirty then recruited the next sort of layer of people, and and then by that point you're you're at maybe like sixty or seventy people. And, and 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 you still have that very very tight core and and you know very very strong culture and and then it at that point you have this kind of critical mass of people and 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 and, and, and you know who are all like very much aligned and then i think it uh, becomes this like almost self reinforcing thing I was just so go gonna ahead, say, I, I, yeah, I was gonna say, I find like your conversation around this really interesting because we've talked about culture in a couple of these conversations, and for me, like, I, I very much agree with with how you were setting this up, where like the culture part is incredibly important, and thinking about it very early and building up this really strong foundation, um, and then you know as new people come in, that's already there. Whereas like some of the last few studios that we talked to, I think the culture was forming, but they didn't really codify it or um you know get kind of intentional about it until they started getting past like 15 20 30 people um and you know i'm my theory is that kind of the worst way to do it is to not think about it at all (laughs) until it's kind of too late and you're trying to like slap paint you know on a house that's with a roof that's leaking um you know the 
when you look back at the early days, you know, you, you said that you were going through like this net Netflix deck, like slide by slide, like, did you like put down everything into like an employee handbook and like, you know, how much of the time was really spent like architecting this and building the foundation before you really started to like actually work on games or do that? Or was it kind of like in conjunction with it? Well, it was in conjunction with it. And, and you know, by that time, I, I really want to like tell like what's one of my biggest mistakes that I've ever, ever made uh, was, was that, you know, we actually, we, we did talk about the culture like so much, you know, with the first six people and even, you know, and, and the, I, I felt that as a company, we talked about the values and culture a lot. But, uh, but then, and, and on my to-do list, I always had this, uh, the top item was that, hey, you know, like, uh, uh, I mean, write all the values down and, you know, formalize the culture into some kind of document. And that was always the, on top of my to-do list, which I have on my desk, desktop. And, and then I was always like kind of, you know, quote unquote, too busy to get onto it. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, fast forward two years and, and now we are like 50 people. And I still remember this one meeting uh, we had and I, there's one person in that meeting was talking about the value of responsibility, which was one of our key, key values at the time and still is. And, and, and when that person was talking about responsibility and about that value, I realized that actually when he talks about responsibility, he mean, means something pretty different to what I mean with that, with that same, same value. And that was a huge wake up call for me. And then, okay, now I'm actually gonna get to that. And, and then what I did was, but I spent time, like I had one-on-one -on -one meetings with every single employee uh, or, or supercellian at the time. And it actually took me a lot of time. And I just asked really simple questions like, you know, what, you know, what do you like about supercell? Like what should never ever change about supercell and, and what you don't like and those type of things. And, and, and then like, uh, and that, because I wanted to also see like, you know, what, what, what really like what, what is the culture? Because I mean, obviously like culture isn't something that the leadership can decide, but okay, here's the culture. I mean, it, it actually is all about the people and what they, those people do like in, in the everyday work. But thankfully, I, I mean, even though it took a lot of effort, you know, um, I, I sort of like, basically I, I kind of then summarized all the input I got from our people, like with some of our original thoughts. And then that became kind of first uh, version of our sort of culture, culture deck. But I, I wish I had, done the same thing when there are six people it would have been much much easier yeah there's something really powerful about just having written written down um for employees which i didn't realize you know had that much value and i think some of it is like you said because what you're thinking of responsibility might be what someone else thinks of and um i was just i i mentor a couple people in the industry and i was just talking with a woman who has a small studio now and she's like just getting that kind of document together and you know, I think she wants it to be perfect before she gives it to the team. And I was like, you know, why don't you just say, hey, this is a draft. Like, why don't we work on this together? Like, why don't we collaborate on what this is? Because, yeah, you're right. Like, you can't really dictate it from the top down. Um, you can, you you know, you need to set examples and, and you want to put that. But you can't just say, like, we are this kind of company um, and then not act on it or not hire around it. You know, um, it's, it's nice to hear that it was kind of like this um, collaboration and a, yeah. a conversation. Yeah, you know, it, it, exactly. And, and, you know, it's, it's funny to me, like, given like, how much we value culture and how much we talk about it, like, we've actually, I think we made a, quite a few mistakes, like, regarding, like, how we kind of, uh, it, it, how we kind of uh, have processed the culture. So, I mean, you know, as I said, I, I didn't, we, it took us, it took us forever, or, or it took me forever to kind of formalize the culture in, into a written document. But then we made other mistakes, too. Like, for example, at some point, like, our culture, like, like got to, quite detailed and it had quite many values, etc. And then the, the reaction from our people and, and I guess myself too was that oh you know it's getting too complicated. People don't really people can't memorize all of this stuff. And if they don't remember the values and they don't re remember everything, you know, what's the point then? Uh, and then we, we we kind of went to the other extreme where we kind of like streamlined the deck a lot and it, and it but it essentially became uh, this like collection of like almost like buzzwords and catchphrases they all sounded very <laughs> cool and it was really easy to remember them like we had stuff like supercell first etc but the downside was that again it was it was pretty they were pretty vague and, and again people didn't really understand what we meant by them and then at that point uh, this is like uh, i don't know maybe three years ago or, or four years ago uh, no, it's actually less than that. We, but anyway, we, we decided, that, okay, let's actually, let's forget about the, the deck. It's actually, you know, write a like 
good old fashioned Word document. <laughs> and that's what we have today. So we have this, uh, I don't know how many pages is, it is, but maybe like around 10 pages of a kind of cultural memo where we actually like in detail, we outline and, and try to give like practical examples of, of a culture in action. And right now what we're doing in, in addition to that is that we are kind of collecting like these kind of super self cultural moments and stories from our people. Uh, and, and we hope that these, these stories like really like put the, uh, put, 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 like really like a show like what the culture is, is, is all, all, all about. And, and you know that I, I think has been been quite quite valuable. What uh, I'm curious, like what ended up driving as as this stuff evolved over time, the, the on the culture side, like was it, you know, were, were you just kind of continuously getting feedback from from the people and from the teams, or was there also some of like as the as the company evolved, how much kind of drove that? Where it was like, hey, this this you know maybe this cultural piece worked for us when we were smaller, but now that we're you know, now that we're twice the size or now that we have six teams instead of two, like how much of that was also just a, hey, we should revisit this, like, you know, on a, on a periodic basis because we're in a new phase of the business versus, you know, is it just something you were always talking about and always reevaluating and that's why it sort of continued to change? Well, that's a great question. You know, like when we started, like when we, and when I thought about culture, I, you know, there, there was this most spirit there. I thought that culture is like so sacred that, you know, you know that it's, it's like, it's almost like set in stone. And it took me a while to realize that that's, that definitely is not the case. Like, uh, you know, obviously like as you can learn more and, and, and a situation change, I mean, of course the culture needs to also change and, and more than anything, the culture can get better. Uh, and, and these days, you know, we think about our culture the same way we think about our games. I mean, we, we want our games to you know, get be better like every single week for our players. Well, in the same way, we believe that our, cult uh, that our culture can also get better, like, you know, for, for all the super, super salience. And, and these days we, we regularly revisit the, 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 the culture and, and, um, and, you know, we do things like, like we have this uh, very small leadership team of three people, but what we do with the leadership team is that, uh, you know, we, we meet with every single team at Supercell. Um, uh, these days, I think we have roughly like maybe 40 teams uh, uh, in, in different areas and we meet with them and, and, and basically, you know, we, we set up a meeting and we, we, the only thing we talk about is culture. So we may obviously we kind of remind them of, of the latest version of the culture memo or the culture deck and then we basically ask them that, okay, like, you know, what, what, what is still true today and, you know, what, what are the things that you, we should change? And and I, I think you know in, in today's world it's it's very very important. And Ilka, by the, by the way, I just wanted to um, uh, just mention that uh, we have Paul Davison on on the stage who uh, I wanted you to also meet. Obviously, where he's he's uh, he's he's on the on the team that's built Clubhouse. Hey, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt the conversation. I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic to have you. Welcome. Oh man, it's so great to be here. Thank you so much for for being here. Andrew mentioned that you were going to come on, and I'm like, oh, that's amazing. So, um, but again, I don't want to interrupt. I always I always ruin conversations by turning them towards Clubhouse. But uh, <laughs> I'm just a happy listener. Well, I, I feel I feel like both Ilka and Paul are are responsible for uh, you know, making, <laughs> I know making making the most engaging and uh, addictive experiences on my on my phone. <laughs> You know, which, which is totally Hopefully, true. time well spent. That's all. That's all we can hope for. Yes. <laughs> well, but I thanks very much for enabling enabling this platform. It, it's such a, such a fun fun concept. Really enjoying it. Oh, amazing! Means a ton coming from you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. So, Olka, just I, I wanted to maybe take the conversation in a slightly different direction. I, I feel like we've spent um, we've come to a good good understanding of sort of the importance of culture and sort of the org design and. Um, and, and, and the formation of Superstar and also in your eventual success. I think um, give, given the number of folks in the audience here who are actual sort of product designers and, and game developers and folks that are in the trenches right now that are actually building games, um, wanted to take a few seconds to just sort of dive, dive into the actual sort of product um, discussion if we can about, um, you know, maybe maybe picking one one or two of your titles that you felt like were particularly good examples of sort of the way that you guys sort of ideated and came up with a game idea and tested and, and got that to launch, um, you know, perhaps Heyday or, or Clash of Clans, like some of your earlier titles would love to, 
what to do with deeper dive and uh, you know what you felt made that work and sort of that the decision making process around that, et cetera. Or anything that you can share? Uh, sure. So I think the one maybe interesting thing that you guys might might find might find hilarious actually is that if I look at the or think about the last uh, maybe even three titles that they put out. So uh, so our first title was Heyday, and then closely followed by Clash of Clans. But then it took us a while to get the next one out. The third game was Boom Beach. Uh, then the um, fourth one was Clash Royale, and then the latest one is is the fifth one is is Brawl Stars. And 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 you know the interesting thing is that by by this time, like all of these five games have have grossed more than a billion billion dollars, and so been like really really successful games. But the interesting thing is that the, if I think about the last three releases, you know each of them have like encountered like a lot of like skepticism like even internally uh, and and you know if it and for example like case in point is boom beach like the, the game number three from us I, I i fondly remember this one meeting where we had like all the leaders of our game teams and and you know people were really worried about boom beach and they're even questioning like whether we should uh, release it in the first place and and then the discussion actually like started to be quite heated and and then i Suggested that hey you know let's let's sort of do a vote here like how how many like vote uh, that they should kill this game and out of I think there's ten leaders of the mm -hmm. game team so ten people I think nine voted that let's kill the game and the only person who said that we shouldn't kill the game was the leader of the Boom Beach team of course and and I I, I remember this moment that you know like we we were in, we felt that we were at this either we sort of like take the view that okay. You know, nine out of ten of our most experienced, like kind of a, uh, you know, game team leaders. You know, nine out of ten believe that this game should be killed, uh, and and you know, like, you know, and you know, at least probably, you know, that probably is the, the right kind of a business decision. Like, uh, you know, if you think about the probabilities, because only like one out of ten like thinks otherwise. But then they thought that oh, like, um, if we now like do. Uh, even if that would be the right kind of business decision, it probably is, uh, or it, 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 it definitely would be the wrong decision, like from culture point of view. Because I mean, if we now decide that they are going to kill Boom Beach, after that we can't say that Supercell is all about, you know, these independent teams that they call cells and the teams actually own what they do. And mm -hmm. then they decided that, you know, that it actually doesn't matter to us, like whether it's a right or wrong decision, like from business point of view, because it's going to be the right decision from culture point of view, like no matter what happens. And then, of course, we, we you know, the Boom Beach team like continued their work and went on and released this really successful game. But, but the really interesting thing is that the, almost the exact same thing has happened, both with Clash Royale and Brawl Stars. And I, I think the point is that, hmm. you know, wow. success, that success is like never... And the biggest, biggest successes are never obvious, like from the start. It's always really later or, or or early on. Like it's easy to kind of say or look back and then you know connect the dots. But it's yeah. almost impossible to do it like when it actually happens. And 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 you know like for example like Brawl Stars was a very very different game from us. We hadn't ever done uh, anything like that, and I, I don't think there was anything like that on mobile even. And 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 even people internally at Supercell were saying things like. You know, oh, uh, it doesn't look and feel like a Supercell game. Uh, you know, it's not a mobile game in the first place, and you know things like this. Uh, and and because it was so so different. But I'm but the thing that I'm so proud of of the company and and about the culture is that you know I, I think that in in many other companies the end result would have been that none of these games would have been released. But you know, like you know, in in our culture, like people understand that it that the, the whole the foundation of the culture is this notion of these independent teams, and therefore it, it is up to the team, right? And and they get get to decide. And but you know those have been probably some of the biggest learnings for for me, and, and, and especially also, I, because this thing has repeated over and over again. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd love to hear maybe for um for uh you know Brawl Stars or or, or Clash or whatever whatever you'd like, just a little bit more about kind of the some of the ups and downs. Like, can you can you talk a little bit about you know, maybe maybe a point in the game, and maybe you can describe the game for the folks who maybe haven't played it. But um, you know, where you felt like the game wasn't working, and kind of you know a little bit into the nuts and bolts of how you ended up deciding, you know, ma making it actually work out. Yeah, um, obviously we can we can talk about it. Like I, I think you know, like Supercell is a lot of uh, 
interesting company from, from point of view, but in, in many companies, like uh, it, it, CEOs get like very, very close to these type of things. Uh, with us, it's, it's almost the opposite. So because the game, it's up, these, these game teams are like, literally they are like, as you could think of them as their own independent company. So, so uh, I, I don't even like, uh, like get involved in, in like detailed oh, discuss, discussions or even decisions. Uh, right. So, uh, so all I can offer, I guess, even in in in, in this chats like this, is more of kind of higher level level views. And but I but I you know just observing from the outside, I think every single one of these games has had their kind of a ups ups and downs, and it's it's a kind of roller coaster ride, as I'm sure like everybody who's listening and working games know. You know, on one mm-hmm. day you feel great, and oh, this is going to be the next hit game and and you know a week goes by and you know just then it feels that oh it's never gonna work and then you know and and then you, this it's just this roller coaster ride and that's you oh. know what i've seen like happening i think in in, in every one of yep. these games yep so 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 how so I, I guess it's just being very tactical about it um how do you determine i guess if, if that something is, is is not working and and and, and what what to do um since i feel like the, the the process that you're describing here, and you know, in in, in tech, some folks call it navigating the idea maze, right? Like you're you're sort of fi- trying to find product market fit, it's not quite there. Like, you know, users aren't showing up to to, to, to play the game or, or use the product, and in some cases, like it can take years to, to figure that out, and in other cases, it take it's it's weeks or months, and and it just it's accompanied by like a sudden insight. Um, curious, like, what what was what was the process by which you you've been able to do this not not once but but multiple times it sounds like across all of these games um you know is it was it metrics was it you know was it the, a handful of sort of key people that was responsible for for coming up with an insight um it's just just talk talk to us a bit about that sort of uh that, that part of the process sure so first of all it's really important to understand that but supercell as a company we don't green light game ideas I mean, we we green light themes, so so you know that's that and that really is the only decision point that we have. That you know, can this theme like exist within Supercell? But if the answer is yes, here's a a, a Supercell game theme. Then, as I said, that team is completely free to build whatever game they want. Of course, you know we have a this like kind of a. Uh, framework that we use and and kind of the, the, our aspiration, as I said, is to gil, uh, to is to create great games that as many people as possible would play uh, for years and years and that would be remembered forever uh, and, and we are always trying to address the, the widest possible market but but you know within that, that sort of a kind of framework when these these teams are free to innovate and build what they what they want uh, and and you know we're really the only instance that can decide to kill a game is it's the team itself so for example that decision has never come and it won't ever come come from me uh, because and the reason is that I I, I trust our team mm-hmm. and 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 in a theoretical situation that I that I did I, I didn't trust our team I think then you had a bigger bigger problem but as long as I, I trust the teams and those de- teams are free to make make those calls and, and and you know how how it works is is that you know again like observing observing from a distance is that you know these teams that start usually very small it's it's usually like maybe two three people who who have an you know idea that they want to pursue. And then they uh, uh, kind of pitch it to some other developers, and you know people who get excited about about it. Then they join the team, and now you have a team maybe of maybe five to maybe seven people max. Uh, they they build like what they call a kind of company playable. Uh, then they and everybody at Supercell gets to play the game. They collect feedback, uh, and as 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 you may imagine, like you know. Supercell has a lot of people who are very passionate about the games, so so sometimes the feedback can be really harsh, as as well. Um, which is sometimes mm-hmm. it's good, sometimes it's bad. Uh, but anyway, then it, again, it's up to the team to decide that okay, after this company playable, are we gonna like continue or not? And oftentimes the answer can be that no. Uh, it, it seems that we we aren't on anything, and you know, let's scratch this game and 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 maybe we wanna try building some other games. Uh, but uh, but at some point, like uh, you know, in an ideal case, a team reaches a situation that okay, now we have a game, and, and we'd, we'd love to see like what the real players think about the, the game, and, and then they kind of like soft launch it into kind of a, or what we call the beta. Uh, so we do a limit release, 
usually in countries like uh, say Australia, New Zealand, sometimes Canada, sometimes the Nordic countries. May, we may add like uh, one or two mm-hmm. countries from a- Asia, etc. And then, and at that point, like you know, uh, the the focus shifts to kind of uh, look, looking at the metrics. And, and the, by far the most important metric, metric that we look at are the retention and engagement metrics. And, and basically we are trying to figure out like whether this game has a shot at, at, at you know, being a game that people play for years and years. Uh, and, and that's what we look at. But again, it's, 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 it's that, that, you know, we don't have an external team that would come in and, you know, like look at and analyze those metrics. It's, it really is the game team. Who kind of owns that decision? Of course, they you know talk to everybody in the company to 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 be better informed. But it, it's very important to understand that the game team owns that. And and then at at some point, like if if you know the metrics and the game team, like based on the metrics and their own like gut feel, if the game team feels that oh this is a game that they should launch globally, then we have a discussion about it. Like uh, well, basically the game team and the leadership team, and if you all agree, then they approach it to the global launch. But that really doesn't happen often. So we, so far we've made that decision de- decision five times. So, what what are, what are some of those target sort of metrics that you typically look for? You know, we, we've kind of talked about D one, D seven, D thirty retention. Curious if there's sort of an internal set of benchmarks that you guys aim for. Um, you know, what what's you know good, great, and and what's what's unacceptable and needs to be killed, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think the main, it, I mean, of course, it's it's a set of metrics that we, we look at uh, and, and it maybe probably depends a bit on the game. But I, but I guess like ideally what we would like to see, say the day 30 being is around 20 percent, you know, to be very, very concrete. I mean, that's I mean, that that usually like would tell us, you know, that, OK, now we are actually are onto something and it something that can actually last for, for a long time. But then, of course, you know, it also depends on like uh, a lot on the audience size as well and you know and, and, and all those things but then once you can start to get into scale like it's it's the day for early retention that is the most important metric that they, they look at how how did especially early on in in like when you first la- launched like uh clash of clans for instance is it the process of how you make games that helped make you so successful globally especially in asia and the fact that you were so successful in china it's only a handful of studios have been able to to do that, and it doesn't sound like your product development process was in the mindset like, you know, this has to work from the get go everywhere, or we're going to make games that are going to be globally appealing. But it seems that just the way that you do creativity has has gotten there. I, was that like how did how did you find success in in Asia and 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 most importantly in China? Um, what resonated most on either the creative side or, or other? Uh, sides that'd be that'd be awesome to hear about yeah it's it, it's a great question and uh it, i mean and, uh, and you know i don't think there are like any like magic tricks that you can pull off so i, I think it, it it all like it comes down to the you know just creating a great game and and you know something that sort of stands out and is is, is different and uh and you know we've had these discussions many times internally that I mean, obviously, like it's important that you know, like say, in a in a market like China, you know, we have a fantastic team in Shanghai, our local marketing team, and also these days a studio in Shanghai, uh, and of course a fantastic partner in in Tencent as well. Uh, so we get a lot of support uh, in, in in China. Uh, so of course, you know, we 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 what what is important is that you know we we can build a lot of. A, the marketing like from ground up and and you know like in china and, and so that it kind of feels feels local and and obviously the player support needs to be local etc but i but you know we still like are, are kind of big believers in that you know we want to build these global games and and you know the soul of the game you just can't change it uh f- for any local market you know the game is it is what, what it is and, and and then of course we hope that it you know, people in as many countries as possible would would like it, but we are very kind of centered on on, on I, this idea of, of creating clo- global games. Uh, but then, of of course, like uh, you know, we we we, uh, we we do whatever we can via our local marketing teams to kind of a uh, you know tell about those games in in a way that is like most applicable in in, in each of those markets. But you know, we 
we haven't like changed our games um, in in any meaningful ways for any any local markets. That that is amazing though that the local marketing um cuz I mean did you early on when you started building the brand narratives around uh the clash kind of universe like was it did it like kind of blow your mind when you saw like a cartoon for clash of clans or you know or when you saw some of those in market like narratives uh, or videos in China like what was that like seeing like it, uh, it you know the brand come to life in that way where it really felt like so much deeper than just the game but like a world well you know it it, it feels incredible uh, i i still can't believe it to be honest uh, you know it's i, I still remember the well, well i re- still remember the day when i was going to to the subway in helsinki and i saw somebody playing heyday i mean I, that felt amazing but but then you know fast forward a year or two and then i remember being tokyo uh and, and then you see like other people and lots of other people you know playing our games and and, and that's what feels like absolutely unreal and and i think we and and the most recent recently i kind of uh, we, ha- we had this feeling uh, that when brawl stars launched in, in 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 south korea and you know just walking out in in seoul i think at at some point i think they calculated that it was way more than 10 percent of the people they're actually playing playing our game that's one single game it was just crazy so i mean literally like and because you play brawl stars in a uh, in, in the landscape mode. I mean, if, if I saw somebody in the, say, for example, in the subway or, or, or a bus, like, you know, holding their mobile phone in, in, in the, like, uh, horizontal mode, I, I could already guess, like, what they're doing with their phone. <laughs> so that, that, that's an incredible feeling, actually. I'm curious, like, for the, <clears throat> since you said you, you mostly you fund teams, not games, has there been any instances where, like, a, like a team has pretty strongly pivoted the game that they initially set out to make that has become successful? Like any of the five games you guys launched, did they start out as something very different from what they ended up being? Uh, yes, uh, and that's one of the other reasons why I said, you know, we, we kind of green light themes, not not the ideas. And I, and I think it's a, you know, I've done a bit of investing just on a personal side, and I think it's a bit of the same thing with the companies, right? So, you know, oftentimes it's not the original idea, like, and especially exactly as they, they kind of foresee it and that the team pursues. Uh, and the, the, the idea isn't like, obviously it's not realized exactly in the way that they thought it would be. And, and oftentimes there might be a really major pivot on, on how they actually implement the idea. And, you know, Supercell as a company is a great example. I mean, we started with a completely different sort of platform strategy, for example, as, as we have today. So we, we started with this idea of, of creating like cross-platform games back in 2010. And then at some point, we kind of pivoted to be ex- exclusively on tablets and, and, and smartphones. And, and, and so this is in, in, in late 2011. And those are big pivot, pivotal moments for the, for the company. Uh, and then I guess for that reason, like many investors, you know, they obviously they care more about the team and they care about the idea. And I, I think it's exactly the same thing when you're starting to build the game. So in, in many instances, like, I, I, I would say that all, in all instances, the game is, 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 is at least somewhat different to what, what they had imagined in the early on. And, and, and oftentimes it can be quite, quite a, very much different to what was, what was imagined when they started. Got it. Maybe um, it, this is sort of a, a funny question that, that came in from the audience. Um, You've talked a lot about the importance of people and, and teams and, you know, starting with the team first and, and then the game comes out of that. Um, what, what are the best, uh, who, who are the best sort of like one to two people that you've hired and how could you tell that they were awesome? Well, at Supercell, it, it would be impossible, just absolutely impossible to name two. I, I probably should name like a, 250 at least, if not 350. Uh, <laughs> so, so, and I'm, I'm not actually kidding. I, I'm honestly, I'm not kidding. I mean, we hire so. I mean, we. I mean, if, if you think about it, like we are 11 years old as a company, and we are, let's see, we are 340 people. So from there, you can do the math, like how many people we hire per year. So we don't hire too many people, and 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 we we are re, the bar is like really really high. And, and one of the rules that we use in hiring is that every new person that we hire must must like kind of sort of erase the imaginary kind of average quality of people we have. So uh, and and you know I mean 
and, and you know, I think we've been very, very lucky that it, it feels that, you know, uh, we, we are just constantly, constantly hiring better and better people. And, and these days, like, uh, I mean, the one thing that I forgot to say by, by way about our the early start is that, you know, when, we, when you kind of start to grow the company through like your own network, one of the risks that you face is that it becomes this echo chamber. So you only hire people who are exactly like your founding team. Mm-hmm. But, but, but we, were, we were in a really lucky position that very early on, we started to hire people like who were coming from abroad. And, and you know, obviously those people have vastly different networks and come from vastly different backgrounds than, than we do. And, and these days, I think two thirds so more than more more than sixty percent of the people we, who we hire to Helsinki come from somewhere else in Finland. So it's a very kind of multicultural uh, uh, in, in environment that that we that we have. But you know, like we, I mean, what? But I can say like uh, just to like uh, I mean, what what makes somebody successful at Supercell is that you know that somebody must like have this very entrepreneurial mindset. So you have to be like proactive, and, and you know, like we. We have this saying that you know if you need a boss to tell you what to do, then Supercell probably isn't your your place. And, and we, we want to have those type of people. And actually, like uh, many of many of our like uh, best best people, like you know, have previously been either founders of, of their own companies, a gaming companies, but then they decide that decided uh, to to maybe join us because they want to focus on only on developing games and not running the company and everything that comes along with it, uh, or they've had like even like managerial or, or leadership positions at different type of companies. But, you know, then they uh, have figured that no, this is uh, actually I, rather, than, rather than spending all of my time like managing people, I'd rather actually be focused on, on building games and, and on the product. So lots of those type of people or people at least with that type of mindset, they, they do really, really well. So essentially, I guess people who don't don't need a manager. Mm-hmm. That, that that would also resonate well with the culture that you built. You know that the entrepreneurship I think works best with the at the bottoms up culture. So it makes sense in terms of like having having the talent match the culture. Um, so we've got uh, we've got about ten minutes left, and I, I wanted to spend some time, um, you know, on on forward looking things that were not specifically related to Superstar, but just you know, picking picking your brains and your sort of collective experience and wisdom over the years. Um, you know, as as you're looking as you're looking out to the future today, um, you know, what, what are some of the things that you're most excited about? And you know, it, it could be games, it could be other 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 areas as well. Um, you know, just just from your vantage point as an entrepreneur and an industry veteran, um, you know, what, what are you most excited about as you look out to the future? Well, I I am I'm excited about the fact that I feel it, it's still very early days for our industry and also like for Supercell as the as a as a company, and, and you know, like uh, you know, I'm fascinated about like all of these innovations that you know pop up like uh, every once in a while. Like for example, the the clubhouse that we are now, you know, this is this platform that we are now now using, and and you know, there are like these innovations that innovations that fundamentally change like how how people kind of behave and and interact, and and that's and I I've always been like uh, fascinated about like the kind of social interaction. And, and 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 you know building you know social ties via via technology platforms and I, I think games can play a huge role on that and have played already of course and but I I think it still feels feels like that if you think about especially mobile as a platform and and the types of things that it enables from like social interaction point of view and and, and different ways people could actually play games together it still feels that you know we are st- just like scratching the surface here and and you know what what are, what are some ex- I, I i find that just double clicking in that really quickly because, because we we also find that super exciting what, what are some examples of things that you've seen or um are, are thinking about in that area sort of new new social interactions well I, well I, I think you know i mean i mean if, if you look at the most successful games games today, and and you know like you look at something like Fortnite or or, or even like you if if I look at our some power games like Brawl Stars, you know they're you know the whole point is about playing them together with other other people. You know they have like uh, they become these kind of social hangouts, like especially for the kind of younger generation, and mm-hmm. and 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 of course Fortnite has led the way like in in many different ways, and you know like games are in a way like have become like platforms in in in, in that sense uh, and uh but you know but i i think there's like so much things 
but but you can still do and 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 so much different gameplay that you can explore if you if you think about the game as a kind of social experience and and you know we uh we, we for sure are are gonna have like a or are, are, are at least are trying to build like those type of uh, new experiences if I look at some of our new games that we have on our on our pipeline. But that's maybe like something that I'm most excited about. I mean, I know that lots of people in, in our industry are also in, just, you know, excited about the technology, like, you know, you know, increasing processing power and, you know, the higher fidelity gains that it enables. And of course, all of those things are sort of cool in, in my opinion as well, of course, but I still like, like, what I like, tr- I'm truly excited about it. It's more on the social side rather than on the kind of the kind of technology and you know high fidelity immersion side of things. Elka, I was also going to ask you um, quickly. You know, a, a, lo- a lot of what you've been doing has obviously been on um, on mobile um, exclusively, and then there's this big trend towards everything being cross platform and cross play, etc. Um, how, how do you, how do you think about you know building building PC games, building console games in addition to uh, to, to the mobile stuff that you've already been excellent at? Well, that's a great question, and of course something that we've thought about a lot, like over the last last uh, many many years actually. And of course, you know, we've uh, evaluated opportunities to expand our games to other platforms in in, in multiple different points in points in time. And and, and for us, I, I guess there's a couple a couple of ways to think about it. So the well, the first one is that you know, as I say, like it's really important for us that we make always the biggest possible impact, and we touch as many players as 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 we can. And and from that perspective, you know, mobile is a great platform that you can you know reach like so 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 many so many people. Um, and and then I I think a key question for I mean for us to like bring any of our games to to any other platform, the reason should be that you know this game is a better experience on this platform than it's on on mobile uh, and uh and and so far i, I guess like then we really like you know uh, have, have thought about it they haven't yet arrived to the kind of conclusion but but you know but okay here's a game that actually it, it's so much better on, on this other platform which is not mobile but it would be worth the kind of effort and we have rather like you know wanted to stay focused and, and trying to just make the mobile experience as, as great as, as, as it possibly can be, but you know that's not to say that it wouldn't wouldn't ever happen. And and you know we've uh, of course like internally done like some experiments on on this. Uh, you know nothing nothing like nothing like concrete really to talk about at, at this point, unfortunately. But uh, but uh, and, and 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 at least for for now, you know we we will uh, and on our a, a kind of mobile exclusive company. But again, as I said, you know that that could could change and 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 supercell. Again, is and we are a very team-driven culture, a very team-driven company. So if we had a game team um, that wanted to build something that is cross-platform, I mean, there's absolutely nothing stopping them to to, to do that. And if I would have to guess, you know, it, it's going to happen at some point. That makes sense. It's a uh, it, it's exciting to think about that the diversity of the efforts that that, that must be happening when when you have. You know, so many small cells of people that are working on games and um, they, they can all be interested in, in very different things. Um, maybe one variation of my last question, which is um, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on. If you had to do, if you had to build a new company today from scratch, you know, knowing all of the lessons that you've learned from, um, from, from your time at Supercell, um, how would you how would you go about it differently? Like, would you build would you build another game company? Would you do something something different? Um, like, and 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 how and how would you how would you approach it? Um, good good question. I mean, obviously, I've been like so uh, focused on Supercell that I haven't really even thought about it much. Uh, so still, so there's so much still to do at, at Supercell, and as I said, it's it's very early days for us. But if I had to do do it again like uh, the, the things that I wouldn't change like on, on how we went about it with Supercell is I, I think uh, first of all it, it's all about the people and the team I would just relentlessly focus focus on that then I, I think the other thing is that um, and this is probably even more true today than it was like uh, 11 years ago is that you I mean today like the market is so crowded with all kinds of amazing products and and, and games but you just have to build something that feels very, very different. Uh, 
and and I, I think you have to be really bold and, and and you know trying to like build something that doesn't really yet exist. So I feel that lots of people are sort of looking at say the top grossing charts and say that oh you know you know here are the, the, the sort of trends and and you know and if somebody if something something is already on the top ten grossing chart and if you're just trying to like build a better version of what what, what already exists it very I haven't really seen that work out like many times I think it's always like the, the people who boldly try something something new and, and bring some bring something that is like very very different you know then when that has a chance to 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 kind of become become the hit so if I would be a a kind of a oh, if I was building a, a new company that's probably the two things I would focus on first building a great great team of, of amazing people and with a great culture but it's the right type of culture for those people and then you know being bold and trying to build something very very different you know something that doesn't exist today makes sense it, it feels like in a in a crowded field especially these days with um with it being hard and ever to sort of break break into the break into the top 10 um making making sure that you truly bring something innovative that people haven't seen before feels that uh, feels increasingly like a necessity um and so with that, we are out of time. Um, we, we normally do this for, for an hour and we went over a bit here. Um, so I, I think the session, uh, this session was just phenomenal and, and we've all learned a lot from company building, the culture building, the sort of um, you know, keep, keeping teams lean and making sure that you, you iterate quickly and are, are sort of uh, are, are actually do it in a very democratic way where you have small teams that sort of make the decisions themselves and, and what to do. Um, so this has been a, a phenomenal session. Does, does anyone else in, in the group have have any other questions that they'd like to ask at the same? No, no, I just mean, wanted I feel... to say thank you, Ilka. Yeah, I, I really loved hearing like how much you all focused on culture and like how intentional you were at the beginning with it. And I mean, as someone who is an entrepreneur, the idea of like having a company where it it pulls in people who have that kind of entrepreneurial spirit to me it's kind of sounds like a little bit of like a utopia idea so i just it's really fascinating to hear <laughs> that so it's, thank you <laughs> thank you for putting something like that together I, I feel like it's it's a lot of people have that intention but don't follow through on it it seems so it's uh it's great to hear that that you did that and you allow the teams to to have that freedom yeah thanks for uh creating a culture where we could get games like clash of clans and brawl stars and clash royale yeah. which i have spent way too much time playing but thank you so much <laughs> well all, all the credit belongs to the teams not to myself so i none of these games have been my ideas and as i said i've been very distant so but i'll, I'll pass that on to the, to the teams. <laughs> let them know <laughs> yeah please do <laughs> awesome thank you thank you Oka, once again for coming on this week's games club and we'll be back next week with uh with, with more with, with more news and sort of trends in, in the games industry and, and thank you for the audience for for joining us today Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thanks. Yeah, thank okay. you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.